Egyptian mythology A to Z. So we're going to continue on by building on this book we introduced in part seven, documenting the cosmological story of Asar. So we're going to read Osiris, Asar, god of the dead, husband to Isis, Aset, and father of Horus, Hru. Osar is the best known deity of the Egyptian gods. Now here's the key. The pyramid text tells us that Asar is the firstborn child of the earth god Geb and his wife Nut, the sky goddess. So once again, as shown and highlighted in previous segments, we're witnessing this cosmological concept of first, the firstborn, which now you're actually seeing is associated with the divinity Asar. Given earthly rule by his father, Asar brought agriculture and winemaking to the people of earth. And in that capacity, Asar was called Wunefer, the eternally good being. So Asar was called Wunefer or Unefer, the eternally good being, the righteous and innocent one. However, because of the jealousy of his brother Set, Asar became the central figure in the Asarian myth, a story of envy and treachery. So Asar has more titles and associations than any other god in the Egyptian pantheon. Asar ultimately became the god of resurrection, which is key, resurrection, he's a divinity of resurrection to whom all people prayed in hope of attaining their own resurrection in the netherworld. And the netherworld is another title or another way of saying the underworld or the ancestral realm. So again, Asar is also a divinity of resurrection, which is important to note moving forward.
continue. So now we're going to get into some more details about who Asar actually is by reading the hymn to Asar found in the papyrus of Ani, the so-called Egyptian book of the dead. Homage to you, Asar, Lord of eternity, King of the gods, whose names are manifold, whose forms are holy, you being of hidden form in the temples, whose Ka is holy. So Asar's Ka, which is his soul, is considered holy. And to reiterate again here, what we discussed in previous segments, your Ka, which is also the term for the first raised land, high land, exalted land, as in Afraka, is also the term for soul, your divine consciousness, because your soul is your divine consciousness. So Asar's Ka is holy. You are the governor of Tatu, Basiris, and also the mighty one in Sechem or Sechem, Litopolis. And the words in parentheses are the Greek renditions of these names, these place names. You are the Lord to whom praises are ascribed to in the gnome of Ati. You are the prince of the divine food in Anu. You are the Lord who is commemorated in Ma'ati, the hidden Amen soul, the Lord of Elephantine, the ruler in the White Hall, Memphis. You are the soul of Ra, his own body, and you have your place of rest in Hen Hen Suit, Hercleopolis. So, here's an example of an actual depiction of Ra Asar, sometimes called Asar Ra, depicted in one body united. So, Ra Asar, tomb of Nefertari. Ra ram headed as Afra and Asar, the mummified bottom portion of the figure. They are united in one body. Asar is referred to as Ka or Ka Atep. This is Afra and Ka united. Afra Ka Ka, he who is upon his Ka. So Asar is directly tied to the cosmology of Afra Ka because he's associated with Ra, and Ra is also associated with him when they're operating and functioning in harmony with one another. Same is true of many of the other divinities in creation when they're operating and functioning in harmony with one another. So this is key because the cosmology of Afra Ka, Africa, is also directly tied cosmologically to the divinity Asar. Because remember, in our cosmology also, Asar and Aset was appointed king and queen by the creator Ra, who's the original and first king in creation. So Ra Rat, Ra Rat, is the first king and queen in creation as the creator and creatress in creation. So Asar inherits his kingship on earth from Ra cosmologically. Asar Aset is the mother and father of Haru, who inherits the divine kingship in return from his father Asar through his queen mother Aset. So we're going to continue reading. You are the beneficent one, speaking of Asar, and our praise in Nart. You make your soul to be raised up. You are the Lord of the great house in Kemenu, Hermopolis. You are the mighty one in victories in Shasatep, the Lord of eternity, the governor of Abydos. The path of his throne is in Tachesser, a part of Abydos. Your name is established in the mouths of men. 
you are the substance of the two lands, which is upper and lower Egypt, upper and lower Kemet, the two lands which was formed upon the unification of so-called Egypt. With Upper Egypt beginning and starting in the Sudan, then later giving rise to the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt, forming the state of ancient Kemet, which Asar and Aset is the king and queen of. Continue. The companies of the gods praise you, and the gods of the Duat, the other world, the underworld, the spirit world, smell the earth and paying homage to you. The uttermost parts of the earth bow before you, and the limits of the skies entreat you with supplications when they see you. The holy ones are overcome before you, and all of Egypt offer thanksgiving unto you when it meet your majesty. You are the shining spirit body, the governor of spirit bodies. Permanent is your rank. Establish is your rule. Permanent is his rank. Establish is his rule. His rank is first. You are the well-doing Sekem power of the company of the gods. Gracious is your face and beloved by him that see it. Your fair is set in all the lands by reason of your perfect law. And they cry out to your name, making it the first of names. And all people make offering to you. So they cry out to his name, making it the first of names. Once again, we're witnessing the concept and cosmology of first. Asar name is referenced as the first of names. You are the Lord who are commemorated in heaven and upon earth, the first, the foremost. Many are the cries which are made to you at the Uwak festival. And with one heart and voice, Egypt, the black land, the land of black people, Kemet, raise cries of joy to you. Continue. You are the great chief, the first among your brethren, the prince of the company of the gods, the establisher of right and truth throughout the world, the son who was set on the great throne of his father Keb, the earth god. You are the beloved of your mother Nut, the mighty one of Valor, who overthrew the Sabawu fiend. So once again, you're witnessing that Asar is being referenced as first chief. Again, Asar originated in the ancient Khan, Kant, Kanit land, now called Nubia, Sudan, etc., which is the first foremost land, the front land, so the Khan land, Kant, the first land, the foremost, head, chief, the land of the beginning, the front land was originally in the Sudan, which was upper Egypt, which later gave rise to the unification of Kemet, who became the two lands. Of course, white Egyptologists hate to explain this because it exposes their propaganda and racist white Eurasian agenda that ancient Kemet was founded by Eurasians from the Mediterranean and West Asia. This exposes and destroys all of that. So now you know why ancient Kemet is called the two lands because of the ancient Sudan, the first land, the foremost land, the front land was originally a part of upper Egypt, which gave rise to the unification of the state. You did stand up and smite your enemy. You set fair in your adversary. You do bring the boundaries of the mountains. Your heart is fixed. Your legs are set firm. Speaking of his impervious mummified form. You're the heir of Keb, which is sometimes spelled with the G, Geb. 
the earth god, the earth, and the sovereignty of the two lands, upper and lower Kemet. The two lands, Kemet, the black land, the land of black people, are content to crown you upon your throne of your father, like Ra. History of Ethiopia, Nubia, and Abyssinia. So now we're going to read about some of the indigenous names and titles for what our ancient ancestors called the front land, the first foremost land, which is the land south of Kemet, so-called Egypt, commonly referenced in more contemporary history as Sudan, Ethiopia, Nubia, etc., so now we're going to deal with the indigenous names and titles for the front, first, foremost land, the head, the land of the beginning. So, the Egyptians of the old kingdom called Nubia, Kent, K-H-N-T, without the vowels, Kant, Kanit a name which means borderland, frontier on the south. In the Old Kingdom, or rather the Old Empire, is actually the oldest time period during what they call the Egyptian dynastic period. Therefore, the ancient Kant, Kanit, which is also vocalized as Kanat, is actually the oldest attestation in primary records of any reference to the land south of Kemet. Yes, the name entitled Kan, Kant, actually predates all the others. So the Egyptians of the Old Kingdom called Nubia, Kant, Kanit, a name which means borderland, frontier on the south, which is very important because the frontier on the south Again, referencing the front land, the first land, also made up the first gnome of ancient Kemet, which began in the south, in Upper Egypt, and in ancient times, again originally included the northeastern part of the Nile Valley Sudan, which is first front, the front land, the frontier that gave rise to the two lands when the state borders of ancient Kemet were founded and formed by our people in Upper Egypt, in Upper Kemet. And again, it's important to remember also, which we extensively discussed in previous segments, the vowels were typically excluded by our ancient scribes in the ancient Merutin Torah, the hieroglyphic language. The vowels were typically excluded by the scribes. So as a result, as a convention in Egyptology, in the field of Egyptology, what Egyptologists did when they were uncertain of how certain words were pronounced, they arbitrarily inserted an E between consonants to facilitate vocalization and pronunciation of words. Sometimes the E they inserted were incorrect and other times they were correct. So in other words, it was a mere guess on their part. Having said that, all of these terms you see here were actually written without vowels by our ancient scribes. Therefore, all of these terms were actually written K-H-N and K-H-N-T. Again, the T, as we mentioned in previous segments also, denotes the feminine or diminutive. So the T feminizes nouns. So the ancestral root was actually K-H-N and K-H-N-T as written by our ancient scribes.
Now, one might ask, if the scribes typically remove the vowels, how do we now determine if the E the Egyptologists are inserting between consonants are correct or not? So again, to briefly reiterate here what we demonstrated in previous segments, how to determine if the Egyptologists got the vowels correct is very simple. So, because our people still speak this ancient ancestral language, and for example, we still have the terms existent in the Chui Akan expression of our ancestral language with the same meanings, we know and have the proper vowel placements and proper vocalizations. Which again, you could see here, the proper vocalization in the Akan language is Kan with the A, which forms the root of the name Akan and Akani. So we're showing an example, the proper vocalization in the Akan language is kan with the A, not the E. So it's not the E that determines the word kan, kant. It's the actual A. So the term is kan, kant, and kanit, which is also vocalized as kanat, which as you can see here in the Akan language is akani, Akan, Kani, Kan. To be first, foremost, first in rank, place, or time. To go before, formally, previously. First, foremost, first, above all things, a long time ago, which is referencing the beginning. So this is what this term actually means. And again, first, foremost, chief, head, leader, etc., are all synonyms in English which are used interchangeably by Egyptologists upon translating the term and name kan, kant. So they translate that term as first, foremost, chief, leader. So this is why you see the various translations of the term referencing the synonyms in English. So as you can see, this ancient ancestral root term kan, kant, is cosmologically and linguistically related to the term and name Afraka and Afrakan, Africa and African, the first highland, the first raised land, the exalted land. As you can see now that it not only references the first foremost front land, but also the first, foremost, front people to go before. Those who are in front, those who are first, the original people, the leaders of the earth. So this term is not only an ancient designation of the Akan people as we know them today, it's a collective designation of our people that originated along the Nile Valley, who gave rise to civilization as Afrakan people, the Kanu people, the Kanitu people. So the proper vocalization is not, as you can see here on the left, Kenichu or Kenchu. It's Kanchu or Kanichu. The U also at the end of the term is plural. So that designates plurality. So it's Afrakanu as plural in our ancestral language, which is equivalent to the S in English, for words like cans, dogs, with the, the suffix s. So the s is the suffix that denotes plurality in English, but in our ancient ancestral language, 
of ancient Kemet, the Medutu, the hieroglyphs, it was the U that denoted plurality. So it's Kanu or Kanitu. Again, the T at the end of the term is feminine. So this is also referencing cosmologically the divine matrilineal inheritance along the Nile Valley. So what you're seeing is that the Akan people actually preserve the name and term in their language cosmologically and also still using the name as a designation for themselves. But this is actually a collective ancient designation for all Afrikanu people, for all black African people and black African people only. So this is what this is actually talking about. So we don't want to get no misconceptions that this is only a term used by the Akan people, but it's actually a term, an ancient term that originally referenced all of our people as the first foremost people. It's just that the Akan people preserved and are still using that designation and name in their culture, their language and so forth. Which needless to say is directly tied and connected cosmologically linguistically, culturally, ritually, to the royal family of divinities, Asar and Aset, who was appointed king and queen by the creator Ra in our ancient Nile Valley cosmology. So Asar and Aset, who's the first, foremost, head, chief, the throne, which is matrilineally passed down to the divinity Hru, the son of Asar, the son of of our set, the queen mother in creation. Now, before we move forward, we're going to continue reading and close out where we left off in the book, The History of Ethiopia, Volume 1, Nubia and Abyssinia. So we're going to continue reading and close out. The Egyptians of the Old Kingdom called Nubia Kant, K-H-N-T, without the vowels, Kant, Kanit, a name which means borderland, frontier, the front land, the first land on the south. A later name was Kenset, K-N-S-T, without the vowels, or in the form in which we have the bow as a determinative. And the determinative is a descriptive symbol that comes at the end of the term in the hieroglyphic language. So a later name was Keneset, K-N-S-T without the vowels, the placenta land, or, and the form in which we have the bow as a determinative. Shows that the bow, pachet, was the representative weapon of the peoples of Nubia. Later still, so a later name also, later still, Nubia was called Sti or Tasti with the vowel Sati, Tasati. The land of the Nubians were Stu, Sachu, i.e. Bowman. So again, the U at the end of the term, Sachu, denotes plurality. So as you can see, all of these terms were actually attested in primary records later after the term kan, kant, whom predates all the other terms. So needless to say, the term kan, kant is actually the oldest attestation of any reference to the land south of Kemet, which is called in contemporary history, Nubia, Sudan, Ethiopia, etc.
However, as you could see, our ancestors had many names and titles for the lands south of Kemet, which you now know the oldest is Kan Kant, Kanit, also vocalized as Kanat, Kanat, the first land, the front land, the land of the beginning, the land where our ancestors were in former times before they founded and migrated into Kemet. So again, all of these terms were attested later, including the term Kash Kush, who was actually attested circa sometime around the Middle Kingdom period, which was roughly 1,000 years after the Old Kingdom term Kan Kant, Kanit, was attested. Of course, the term Kush is very popular, more popular than all the other terms, because of the fictional biblical narrative, the fictional Cush, son of Ham in the Bible. So, of course, this is why you find Cush propagated and parroted by white Eurasians and their Negro flunkies in academia. Not because it was more significant or cosmologically descriptive, but to solely push their Abrahamic lies at the expense of our ancestrally more popular and descriptive titles such as Khan, Kant, etc., whom clearly cosmologically and geographically exposes the true origin and founders of ancient Kemet. So this is why they perpetuate all of these other terms at the expense of the term that 100% and unequivocally exposes their anti-Afrakan, anti-African lies that ancient Kemet was founded by Eurasians or ancient Kemet was some type of isolated, separate nation or country or state from the rest of Africa. So, of course, those are all lies. Once we learn our ancestral languages and start tuning in to who we truly are and stop embracing self-hatred and lies, we'll clearly start picking up our ancestral texts and start reading what our own people carved in stone about themselves thousands and thousands of years ago before a fictional Bible or any Abrahamic religion or references existed on this earth. So now we're going to get into some historiography dealing with the Eurasian authors who were studying and documenting our people when they came into contact with our Nile Valley civilizations, which at that time included other parts of North Afrika and the so-called Near East. So these authors were the invaders themselves or the children of the invaders. Diodorus Sicilis. Library of History, Book 3, The Beginning. So Diodorus Sicilis was a Greek so-called historian who were one of the main ones heavily studying and documenting our ritual observances, our practices, culture, and cosmology at the time he came into contact with our people and our civilizations. And also important to note before we start reading, the term Ethiopia was a general term used by Eurasians at the time to describe black people, which is actually a Greek term that means burnt face. So when you hear this term Ethiopia, we're not talking about the modern country of Ethiopia or its inhabitants. We're talking about the ancient usage of the term 
which again was a general term used by the Eurasians to describe black people despite the location or country they resided. So it had nothing to necessarily do with the particular location, although that term was also used to reference the land south of Kemet as well, because that's the origin of black African people. So they knew this at that particular time. In fact, the term was actually used in a similar fashion back then to how Europeans used the term Negro to describe black people, especially during the colonial period. So this is how the term Ethiopia was used. It was a general description to describe someone that's black, which again is a Greek term, which actually means burnt face. So we're going to read about what they had to say, which actually further corroborates and supports our primary evidences and sources that we were showing throughout our series thus far. Now the Ethiopians, as historians relate, were the first of all men. And the proofs of this statement, they say, are manifest. So let's read that again. Now the Ethiopians, as historians relate, were the first of all men. So once again, you're now hearing from the Eurasians themselves that the so-called Ethiopians were the first of all men. So again, we're witnessing this concept and cosmology of first associated with our people. And the proofs of this statement, they say, are manifest, for they did not come into their land as immigrants from abroad, but were natives of it, and so justly bear the name Atakthones is, they maintain, conceded by practically all men. So, of course, we didn't come into our land as immigrants from abroad, but were natives of it, and so justly bear the name Atakthones, which means Aboriginal, indigenous to the continent of Afaraka, Africa. So, this is what Atakthones mean. It means someone that is aboriginal, indigenous to their lands. So as you could see, us being first in autochthones, aboriginal, indigenous to our lands, were also conceded by practically all men, which means all known races and nations at the time knew we were the first people, Afarakanu, the original people, so all known nations then, namely the Eurasians, knew we were the first born, the original people. Furthermore, that those who dwell beneath the noonday sun were, in all likelihood, the first to be generated by the earth. It is clear to all, inasmuch as it was the warmth of the sun which, at the generation of the universe, dried up the earth when it was still wet and impregnated it with life. It is reasonable to suppose that the region which was nearest the sun was the first to bring forth living creatures. So essentially what he's saying and also describing here of us being closer to the sun and the first to be generated by the earth is of course what they learned from studying our people and our cosmology, which we began demonstrating in part five and conclusively proved, culminating in part seven, how Ra, the creator of the world, in the beginning established the first landmass of earth above the surface of the water, the first raised land, the highland, exalted land, hill, the primordial mound, the Ka, Afrakaka, Afraka, and how his solar energy penetrated that landmass, thus giving rise to Afrakanu, black African humans who originated from up south in the Khan land, the first, foremost, 
the front land, the land of the beginning, which is southeast and east Africa, Africa. So, of course, what he's saying is nothing but corrupted, perverted, the perversions that, of course, made its way into the fictional biblical narratives creation story. Continue. And they say that they're the first to be taught to honor the gods and to hold sacrifices and processions and festivals and the other rites by which men honor the deity. So the Eurasians also knew that we were the first to honor the gods and hold sacrifices and processions and rites, rituals in honor of the deity. So as a result, and that in consequence, their piety, meaning our holiness, our devotion to the deity, has been published abroad among all men. And it is generally held that the sacrifices, practices among the Ethiopians are those that which are the most pleasing to heaven. So as you can see, as a result of us being the first to honor the gods and hold sacrifices and processions and ritual in which men honor the deity, our piety, meaning our holy and religious devotion to serving the gods, were published abroad among all men. So not only did all nations know we were the first foremost people, but they also knew it's only our people and our people only who could make sacrifices that are the most pleasing to the heavens, which means that being the firstborn, we are the only begotten and divinely created human beings by the gods themselves. So we're the direct descendants of the gods. So this is why our sacrifices are the most pleasing to the heavens and the deities. Because again, being their firstborn, we were directly begotten by them as their only divinely created children on earth. So one might ask, how are we, black African people, their only divinely created children? So. What many of our people is not aware of and understand is that not everything that you see in existence today, which includes humans, were divinely created, which means that not everything came into existence through divine sanction of the supreme being. Matter of fact, to make this easier so one could get the full understanding on this, make sure you check out part five of our series where we explain in full details the actual origins and functions 
of all the primordial gods and goddesses who later gave birth to Afrikanu, Afrikaitnu, black African humans in contradistinction to our white Eurasian enemies who were not divinely created with a capital C, but only came into existence due to perverting their own spirit and rebelling against the divine order of the supreme being and the gods and goddesses. So make sure you check out part five to get this particular information and insight in depth and in details. So, Pomponius Mela, Latin Roman author of the first century. So Pomponius Mela, like Diodorus Sicilus, we just read about in his account, is another Eurasian Greco-Roman contemporary who was also studying and documenting our people at that particular time. So in this account, we're going to read about what he has to say about our people at that particular time as well. So, the Egyptians pride themselves, we prided ourselves, just like we do today, on being the most ancient people in the world. So, the Egyptians prided themselves, we prided ourselves on being the most ancient people in the world, the first, foremost, in their authentic annals, meaning in their authentic writings. One may read that since they have been in existence, the course of the stars has changed direction four times and that the sun has set twice in the part of the sky where it rises today. So our people are so old, our people are so ancient that the course of the stars has changed direction four times. So we're talking about the procession of the equinoxes. We're talking about the great year cycles of every roughly 26,000 years as the sun makes its way through the various constellations throughout the course of time. So this is what this is talking about, the procession of the equinoxes. So as you can see, this account further corroborates what we just read in the Diodorus Sicilis account regarding the ancient so-called Ethiopians also being very old and ancient, which of course again references the first people. So essentially what this is showing us is how the Eurasians back then used the term Ethiopian and Egyptian interchangeably. Of course referencing the same Afra Khan, Black African people, the first foremost people, the first born, the original. The African unconscious, roots of ancient mysticism and modern psychology. So in this particular book, we're gonna get into more information that further supports some of what we just read and of course, some of you probably noticed we already mentioned some of this information in previous segments, which is fine because what we're doing now is bringing it all together full circle so we could properly address their fictional Israelite myth. So we're bringing this information full circle in reference to some of what we mentioned already in previous segments. In the royal papyrus of Torin, so the Torin papyrus, which we discuss extensively in part five, the Torin papyrus that highlights the divine dynasties, the gods and goddesses. So in the royal papyrus of Torin are named all of the rulers of Egypt from Mene on. Mene, the first so-called pharaoh of the dynastic period of Egypt. 
the Egyptians themselves dated their own origins to 40,000 BCE, which is over 40,000 years ago. Diodorus Sicily, which we just read about a little while ago, Diodorus Sicilis, said that the gods and heroes of ancient times rule Egypt for 18,000 years and mortal men 5,000 years. There was said to be 23,000 years of civilization in Egypt before Diodorus himself. So Diodorus Sicily, which we just read about, who were talking about how the so-called ancient Ethiopian. So again, you can see he was actually talking about the same so-called Egyptians. So Diodorus Sicily said that the said that the gods and heroes of ancient times ruled Egypt for 18,000 years and mortal men 5,000 years. And there was said to be 23,000 years of civilization in ancient Kemet, the black land, the land of black people, before Diodorus himself. Manito, which is an ancient Kemetu priest, a black African priest, gives 15,150 years to the divine dynasties of Egypt and then 9,777 years to the kings before Mene, which is the pre-dynastic kings. Continue. So he went on to say, this led to a combined history of 24,927 years of prehistory. So let's read that again. This led to a combined history of 24,927 years of prehistory. So this 24,927 years actually corresponds to what they call and roughly estimate as the 26,000 great year cycle, which is predicated on the precession of the equinoxes, which was also alluded to by Pomponius Mella, the Latin Roman author we just read from. So you're seeing that all of these ancient accounts actually coincide with each other because everybody at that particular time knew who we were because this was common knowledge at that particular time as our names and civilization was in all of the Eurasians mouth because they always wanted to conquer and colonize us. So they actually learned of these things when they invaded ancient Kemet and got their hands on some of our writings and came into contact with some of our people at that particular time. So they actually stole much of this information, but also learned of some of it from some of our people. They colonized at that particular time. So needless to say, this is where they're getting some of this information from, which of course they also corrupted fragments of to manufacture their fictional biblical narrative about them being a chosen people who brought civilization and laws to the world. Because it was the same Greco-Roman degenerate mutated hybrid children who emerged from the last ice age who wrote the Bible, our absolute enemies. Herodotus mentions 340 generations of kings and high priests who ruled Egypt before his time. So Herodotus, who's another Greek so-called historian, mentions 340 generations of kings and high priests who ruled before his time as well. And of course, these kings and high priests who he's talking about is of course where they get the whole notion and idea of the Messiah coming from the line of Judah, the royal priestly kingship line coming from the south and the southern kingdom who's supposed to save the world. So these kings and high priests who inherited the divine kingship because remember in ancient Africa and even in contemporary modern Africa, kings are also high priests. They're initiated priests. So this is where they get in this whole concept of the Messiah being a priest and king of the southern kingdom of Judah being a priestly kingship. In fact, the whole Israelite narrative is based on priestly kingship because this is a corruption of Afra Khan, African divine kings who were also priests. They were initiated priests. In fact, the so-called Pharaoh of ancient Kemet was the high priest 
of the land associated with Asar, who also had a shepherd like function, which is why they say about the fictional Messiah, Yeshua or Jesus, the Lord is my shepherd and all of this foolishness. So this is where they're getting this from. So furthermore, he wrote, there's obviously from these ancient accounts, a long unknown history of Egypt. So he even said in his own book that there's obviously from these ancient accounts, a long unknown true story. This is why we call it true story because true story is our story, which is true story. A long unknown true story of ancient Kemet, the black land, the land of black people, the divine land, a sacred land that was birthed by the supreme being through the agency of the gods and goddesses themselves who gave birth to their only begotten and firstborn children, which is Afrakanu, Afrakaitnu, black African people. So there's a long unknown history for a reason because our absolute enemies hate for us to even know who we truly are so we could tune into who we truly are and destroy them. So the list of the Untura, the divinities, the gods and goddesses and demigods who personified natural forces and ruled Egypt during the mystical period are numerous. So he's talking about the actual divine dynasties of the gods and goddesses themselves. So again, go back to part five, where we extensively elucidated and, and documented that. They include the god Ta, Ra, Shu, Geb, Asar, Set, Haru, and Tehuti, Tehuti, Thoth who later became Hermes in the Greco-Latin and Ma'at. And of course, we're going to continue to build on the god Asar. So this is what we're going to get into. So now we're going to quickly highlight what the sister Drusilla Dungy Houston mentioned in her book, The Wonderful Ethiopians of the Ancient Kushite empire so there seems to be a worldwide conspiracy in literature to conceal the facts that this book unfolds because of the suppression of truth royal crimes has been easily made possible against ethiopians and again as stated when we first introduced her in previous segments drusilla dungy houston was a sister who actually pioneered an ancient true story regarding who our people were. So this is what she had to say upon her quest to unravel the truth of who black people were, which as you can see also coincides with what the previous author just said in his book, The African Unconscious. The ancient Greek accounts that he read that there was a long unknown true story of ancient Kemet. So you could see that a lot of our people came to realize this, that there's a true story about our people that they're covering up. So as you can see, clearly, our people are not just making this stuff up. This is actual documented true story that was also mentioned and referenced in the contemporary Greco-Roman so-called historians that were contemporary with the civilizations of the ancient Nile Valley who also expanded in other parts of North Afrika and the so-called Near East at that particular time. So she also went on to say in her book, the chapters of this book prove the Ethiopian race to be the fountainhead of civilization, the first, the foremost, the head. So she also discovered that they were the fountainhead of civilization, the people who brought civilization to the world. And again, Ethiopian is just a general term that people used back then to describe black African people despite location. So it had nothing to necessarily do with a particular location, although that term was also used to reference the land south of Kemet as well, because that's the origin of black African people. So they knew this at that particular time. So she said, if you desire truth, if you desire to be fair minded, to be educated in vital knowledge, not possessed by the average college student, 
If you desire to be an authority upon the life of the ancients, go down with me as archaeology, ethnology, geology, and philology disclose. And this is what we've been demonstrating throughout our entire series. Archaeology, geology, ethnology, philology, linguistics, genetics also, which we demonstrated and proved conclusively in our previous segments as well. So here we have another scholar, Dr. Chancellor Williams, practically saying the same thing we've been demonstrating throughout this particular segment so far in part eight. So in his book, The Destruction of Black Civilization, he said, but the greatest of all issues is right here in the general agreement that the very earliest period known to mankind and African civilization in the areas later called Sudan and Egypt, which we now know is called the ancient Khan, Khanit, Khanat land. So that is originally Upper Kemet in the northeastern part of the Sudan that gave birth to Kemet, the black land that formed the two lands of Lower Kemet and Upper Kemet eventually that became the state. So again, but the greatest of all issues right here in the general agreement that the very earliest period known to mankind and African civilization in the areas later called the Sudan in Egypt was fully developed with all the arts and civilized life already matured. It's beginning being placed so far back into the early history of the world that it is beyond the reach of man because it goes back to the beginning the beginning of civilization, the first, foremost, the head, chief, the front, the south, the beginning when the first raised land emerged from the ocean floor called Ka, Afra Ka. Continue. The second period might well be from the conquest of Lower Egypt by the Ethiopian leader Mene, Narmer, in 3100 BCE, so over 5,000 years ago, to the end of the 6th dynasty, 2181, also the end of the Old Kingdom. So what he's talking about is the period when the state, the nation state of ancient Kemet was formed and established, and how the first so-called pharaoh, Mene, also called Narmer, expanded into Lower Kemet, Lower Egypt, which is the northern part of ancient Kemet. So it was Mene, the first pharaoh who actually conquered Lower Egypt in the north and united the two lands, which originally began in the south in the Sudan, which was Upper Egypt, the northeastern part of the Sudan that formed the borders of the state of Upper Ancient Kemet so-called Egypt. So he says, this was the period that gave birth to Egypt, the two lands, and before which there was no Egypt. It was the period during which black kings united the two lands, started the dynastic lineage system, and began the building of the greatest civilization. So you can see Dr. Chancellor Williams also knew that Lower Egypt, the northern part of ancient Kemet, was not originally a part of the ancient Khan land, the first foremost land, the south, which is front, the leader, the head, the governor land where the royal family of Osar and Osset actually came from. So cosmologically speaking, it was actually the royal family of Osar and Osset's children who found a colony and state of ancient Kemet and united the two lands. They were the leaders. They're the royal lineage. That's the dynastic lineage system. That's the royal line that is matrilineal. It's a matrilineal line, which of course reflects the cosmological story of Aset and Heru.
So what you're looking at now is an actual map from the book of the destruction of black civilization, which Dr. Chancellor Williams calls the Ethiopian Empire before the unification of the two lands. So on this map, it shows Southern Ethiopia and Northern Ethiopia. And please bear with us because the map was big. So it was very difficult to kind of fit the whole thing into the screen. So we're gonna zoom in and out when needed to take a better look at it. Now, what's key here is that, notice how he calls Southern Kem or Kam, Northern Ethiopia and makes no differentiation between the names Southern Ethiopia and Northern Ethiopia, except for the borders that later became the two lands of Kem or Kam, which as you can see, was first formed in Upper Egypt, Upper Kem, Upper Kam, Upper Kemet. So again, as you can see, Dr. Chancellor Williams and many other black scholars also knew that the Khan land, the ancient Sudan, AKA Ethiopia, were the same Afra Khan black African people who came from up south, the south. Remember again, as we discussed in previous segments, especially in part one, south is up. They, so they came from up south, which is up front, the head, migrated down the Nile and founded ancient Kam, Kem, Kemet, Kemet. So you can see on this map, Dr. Chancellor Williams also makes no distinction, makes no distinction between Southern Ethiopia and Nubia and uh, Northern Ethiopia, which is uh, Upper Egypt, Upper Kam, which became the borders. So that, that became the borders of, of Kemet. So that was the state when the state borders were formed and made its way into Northern Kam, Northern Kem, Lower Egypt after 3100 BCE. So this is what you're looking at right here. So the two lands were formed in Kem or Kam. So that's what you're looking at, the two lands. So the, the first land, which you could see originally a part of the ancient Sudan, Ethiopia, Nubia. So Southern Kemet is technically still Nubia because that's the first land. So the second land that was formed and united the two lands were Northern Kam, which is Lower Egypt or Lower Kemet. One day, Simba, the sun will set on my time here and will rise with you as the new king. In this whole night, everything, everything the light touches. So what we're going to do now from this point is further corroborate and substantiate the migration of the royal divinity Asar, which of course also includes Aset originating and coming from the south, up south in ancient southeast, East Afrika, Africa. So as a royal statue, the pinnacle probably also symbolized the ultimate primeval king and royal ancestor, Asar, who is often shown wearing a white crown. So first and foremost, the white royal crown they're speaking of is the original crown of Upper Kemet, Upper Egypt. So that's the original crown of the South before the red crown of Lower Kemet, the North was united with the white crown. So such an identity which can be proved in a roundabout way, may have given rise to the legend reported by Diodorus, Diodorus Sicilis, that Asar originally came from Nubia and colonized Egypt. And the Ethiopian kings wore tall knob crowns. 
So you can see they're talking about the accounts also reported by Diodorus Sicilus, the Greek historian, some of which we just read from a little while ago. And we're definitely going to deal with this particular Diodorus account they're referring to here in a little bit as well. So we're going to continue reading. When the Egyptians conquered Upper Nubia in early Dynasty 18, they evidently believed that they had rediscovered in Jabal Bakar not only the birthplace of Amen, but also the original home of Nekbet, the source of Upper Egyptian kingship and the White Crown. And the Gebel Bakal, they're speaking of here as the birthplace of the divinity Amen, is the Arabic name for what our people consider the holy mountain from which our kingship originated, which was deep into the south in the ancient Sudan. So this holy mountain was a holy and sacred site our people actually rediscovered during the New Kingdom period of ancient Kemet. So again, you're witnessing that our source of kingship actually comes from the south, up south, which was originally in the ancient Khan, Kant, Kanit land, the first foremost land, the sacred land. So our people rediscovered our source of upper Egyptian, upper Kemetu, upper Kamau, the black land, the source of the black land's kingship, which again is the south, deep into the south, as you can see in upper Nubia. Needless to say, as also mentioned in previous segments, this is, of course, where they're getting the fictional story in the Bible of the royal line of the tribe of Judah coming from the south and the southern kingdom from. However, you could already see clearly that the concept of the southern kingdom of Judah being the leader and the head where the fictional Messiah came from and the northern kingdom of Ephraim in their Bible is coming from. So it's no coincidence that that fictional narrative reflects to the T our ancient Nile Valley civilizations, namely Upper and Lower Egypt, which was our southern and northern kingdoms. So, of course, all of that, how so-called Judah, the southern kingdom, and the tribe of Ephraim were at war with each other and were divided at some times and united at other times are nothing but perversions and corrupted fragments of them trying to manufacture a history for themselves because they didn't have any. These spiritual, degenerate, hybrid, mutated children of the last ice age. So they had to manufacture a story based on things that already existed. So you can see these Greco-Romans always wanted to be us, who were studying our ancient Nile Valley civilizations, our culture, our sacred rites and practices. The same Eurasian parasitic spirits of disorder who wrote the Bible. Just like how they attempt to imitate and copy us now while demonizing our culture via our hair, our hairstyles, our food, our music, our art, etc. They, of course, attempted to imitate and copy us back then, while at the same time demonizing us when writing their fake Abrahamic religions. So they always hated us, but loved us at the same time because they are spirits of disorder. And all they do is attempt to parasite off of us when we are divided. Just like how we were united at many times back then, there were times we were also divided, which gave them the perfect opportunity to play us off against each other and take advantage of each other while our civilizations dwindled, crumbled, and fell. And by the way, we'll be remiss to not also mention that, that this mountain, Jebel Bakal, was considered the birthplace of the god Amen which again, as extensively discussed in part five of our series, the divinity Amen is the male complementary half of the Supreme Being, while Amenet is the female complementary half of the Supreme Being. Because remember, Ra and Raat are the creator and creatress in creation, while Amen and Amenet 
comprises the supreme being. The two complementary halves that unites as a supreme being in the hierarchy of creation. Because it's Amen and Amenet that directs Ra and Ra'et to create the world. So again, check out part five, where we extensively detail the divine functions and origins of the primordial gods and goddesses in creation. So we're back to the said Greek historian, Theodorus Sicilis, in the Library of History, Book 3, The Beginning. So there are many volumes of these ancient Theodorus Sicilis accounts, but in this particular portion, we're going to read about what was mentioned in the book we just read, how Theodorus Sicilis wrote how the ancient Ethiopians slash Nubians colonized Egypt. So this is what we're going to read about. And again, remember, Theodorus Sicilis was a contemporary with our ancient Nile Valley civilizations who was studying and reporting what he saw, heard, and learned. So he wrote, they say also that the Egyptians are colonists sent out by the Ethiopians. Asar having been the leader of the colony. Asar having been the leader of the colony. So again, you're seeing Asar associated with rulership and leadership because he's the first, foremost head chief. For speaking generally, what is now Egypt, they maintain, was not land but sea when in the beginning of the universe was being formed. Afterwards, however, as a Nile during the times of its inundation carried down the mud from Ethiopia, so the Nile again, flows down into North Africa because it starts up, up which is south, all the way deep into Southeast Africa in the regions of Uganda, East Congo, Kenya, etc. Afterwards, however, as the Nile during the times of its inundation carried down the mud from Ethiopia, land was gradually built up from the deposit, which again is reflecting how the first land, the front land, the Khan land, how the mud came from the south. So again, ancient Kemet was a colony of the ancient Khan, Kanitu people from the Khan, Kanit land, the first foremost land, the front land. So to give a modern example of how this happened, the founding of the colony of ancient Kemet was very similar in the way how North America became a colony of Europe, namely the British. So you had the British Empire who gave rise to the colonies they quote unquote founded in North America, which of course they came with their diseases and pillage, killed off the people that was already here. Of course, our people, black Afrikan people, black African people were the first to inhabit this particular landmass in the Western Hemisphere. However, these colonies of the British Empire in North America whom initially started in the south, then later became states, which then eventually formed into a whole country and nation. So in ancient Kemet, the first gnomes, which again are city-states in Upper Kemet, Upper Egypt, was founded by the Kanitu people, which of course is why, as you can see here, the actual first gnome of Upper Egypt was also called Ta-Kant, Ta-Kanit which means the land of Khan, Kant, as the frontier, which formed a border in Upper Kemet, Upper Egypt. So you can see the first gnome, which again is the first city-state, still actually references the Khan land as a continuation of the ancient Sudan in Upper Egypt, Upper Kemet, the land 
of black people, which Dr. Chancellor Williams in his book, Destruction of Black Civilization, called Northern Ethiopia, the black land in Upper Kemet. And by the way, you could also see that the capital city of Takant, Takinit, also called Taseti, was actually Yabu or Abu, which the Eurasians call Elephantine. So for those that are not familiar with the biblical fictional history, story, this is why they talk about how the tribe of Judah, the so-called Jews, fled to the island of Elephantine and were living there worshiping Yahoo or Yahweh and all of that nonsense. <laughs> So continue. Also the statement that all the land of the Egyptians are alluvial silt deposited by the river receives the clearest proof in their opinion from what takes place at the outlets of the Nile. For as each year new mud is continually gathered together at the mouths of the river, the sea is observed being thrust back by the deposited silt and the land receiving the increase. So he's talking about here, the annual flooding of the Nile River. Because remember, as mentioned in previous segments also, it hardly ever rained in ancient Kemet. So as a result, our ancestors of ancient Kemet in particular, depended on the annual flooding of the Nile for their crops to grow, to sustain themselves and feed themselves and so forth. Which you could see also for those familiar with the fictional story of the Garden of Eden in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, how their imaginary God, Yahu or Yahweh, said he did not cause it to rain on the earth and there was not a man to till the ground. Yet there came up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Then they went on to say he planted a garden eastward in Eden and put the man he had formed so this whole story of a fictional Garden of Eden and him forming crops and Adam or man is a corruption of our cosmology dealing with agriculture, which of course the god Asar in our set is responsible for as agricultural earth divinities. In fact, this whole farming and agricultural concept dealing with the land and the creation of man could also be found in the famine stella so these are all corruptions in their biblical fictional narrative dealing with their fictional creation story that they corrupted fragments of from our ancient Nile Valley cosmological texts and stories dealing with these divinities in creation operating throughout creation in many different aspects in creation as they function and move throughout creation. So in the last portion here, he says, and the larger part of the customs of the Egyptians are they hold Ethiopian. So let's read that again. And the larger part of the customs of the Egyptians are they hold Ethiopian, the colonists still preserving their ancient manners. So the colonists still preserving their ancient manners, same as how the Europeans who came over here, who brought their culture, their languages, their religions, etc. So something to also note. Just like how not all Europeans, British or otherwise, came as colonists to America or even immigrated later when the United States of America was formed, not all of our people in ancient Kanit, the ancient Khan land, the Sudan, Nubia, Ethiopia, etc., migrated into ancient Kemet when the United Two Lands were formed as the nation state. However, which is very important, just like how the U.S., the United States has a strong sphere of influence in the world today as they colonize and influence much of the world with their language, their body politics, religion, sciences, and education system. Our people within the government of ancient Kemet also over time 
did the same as we expanded our sphere of influence throughout the entire ancient world, most times through peaceable means and other times when needed militarily. So, of course, we're not going to lie here and tell people any type of romanticism because we did this militarily as well when the state borders of ancient Kemet was actually formed upon expanding into the north and conquering those in the north, in Lower Kemet, in Lower Egypt. So he then went on to say, in reference to the so-called ancient Egyptians preserving their ancient manners, for instance, the belief that their kings are gods, the very special attention they pay to their burials, and many other matters of a similar nature are Ethiopian practices, while the shapes of their statues and the forms of their letters are Ethiopians, talking about their writing. For the two kinds of writing which the Egyptians have, that which is known as popular demotic is learned by everyone. So the demotic script, which is a cursive form of the ancient Medutu, the hieroglyphic writing. While that which is called sacred is understood only by the priests of the Egyptians who learned it from their fathers as one of the things which are not divulged. But among the Ethiopians, everyone uses these forms of letters. So needless to say, as you can see, even writing comes from the land south of Kemet, the first land. Africa's development in historical perspective. So in this particular book, we're going to read further about the royal pharaonic state in Upper Kemet, Upper Egypt, actually deriving from the Khan Khanit land, the front land, the first land in ancient Nubia, Sudan. So, behind the rise of the highly centralized kingship of dynastic Egypt. So the kingship was highly centralized, meaning highly sophisticated and hierarchical in nature. May have been an additional factor, the adoption in late pre-dynastic Upper Kemet, Upper Egypt, of elements of the rituals and royal ideology of the coastal kingdom. Early Egyptian royal tombs before the shift to pyramid building in stone, were covered with a conical mound of earth, mimicking the practices known as early as the fourth millennium in Nubia and still prevalent 2,000 years later in the kingdoms to the south. So it was known as early as the fourth millennium in the ancient Sudan, Nubia. So that was roughly 6,000 years ago. So that predates the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt before the state was actually formed. These outward resemblances accompany resemblances in ideology as well. From the special ritual significance accorded cattle to the claims of both Sudanic and Egyptian kings to a degree of personal sacredness unparalleled in the Middle East. So let's read that again. From the special ritual significance accorded cattle to the claims of both Sudanic and Egyptian kings to a degree of personal sacredness unparalleled in the Middle East. So you can see our practices were unparalleled in the Middle East, which means none of our practices come from the so-called Middle East as the fictional Bible would want people to believe in their fictional story of Noah's family surviving this fake global flood, then landing on Mount Ararat which is somewhere in modern day Turkey, which actually never happened. There was never a flood of that magnitude at all on anywhere on this planet. So it's all history's fiction, especially in the story of Ham and his sons supposedly migrating and settling in Afraka, Africa and building civilization, which is absolutely insane for any black person to believe knowing that our very own primary records, 
who could even be further substantiated by archaeology, genetics, linguistics, says the total and complete opposite of where civilization and our people actually originated. So here we're going to read from another source, saying practically the same exact thing. The ancestors of the Kemetu, the Kemites, originally lived in Nubia, the Sudan. The Nubian origin of Egyptian civilization is supported by the discovery of artifacts by archaeologists from the Oriental Institute at Kusto. On a stone incense burner found at Kusto, we find a palace facade, a crown king from the south into the delta. Trigger 1987 noted that evidence that both the red and the white crowns were originally southern Egyptian symbols, upper Egyptian symbols, suggest that most of the iconography originated in upper Egypt, the south. Continue. The research makes it clear that the first Sapats or gnomes, the first city-states of ancient Kemet, were probably founded by Kushites. Again, Kushites is another title of ancient Ethiopians, Nubians, etc. It's another general title. Who spoke a Niger-Congo language and belonged to the Yunanian culture, which is an archaeological term for a particular culture. The A group people were the foundation of the Egyptians. So the A group, another archaeological title again. The Egyptians differentiated themselves from the Kushites once the former city-states or Sapats, the former gnomes, became Kem Kam. So the people that migrated and founded the colony and state of ancient Kemet differentiated themselves from their ancestors once the state borders were formed. The same way how the British descendants in the Western Hemisphere here in North America differentiated themselves from Great Britain in Europe once the United States of America was formed. So you're seeing the actual same thing play out in modern times. The difference is the Eurasians are ruling over us today, whereas in ancient times we were ruling.
jewels on it. We get drunk for the hood. French mom, so figure we be no good. The damn is in your team, you need time to be rude. A deep crap, I need coke, that be the mood. The pequan for swire it great. Obia came in hunting, then I'm on a late. Who need a pry, and think they swore in your face. What's he gonna mean when I ask them for a plate? I know, but though I appreciate the effort. It be confirmed, I'm a steady one method for the record. Me never competition, stay in your lane. Me pay sick, I say, my dear, I'm fame. Your hate the show is a shame. I they feel your pain, my brother. Feeling second go pain, my brother. Fuck it, we come from nothing. So if all of my parties no be set, I will always have to something. We're hustling. Man, man, get your boy happy, man, ten. Since you poor, never won. We win the game. It's a shame. Man, man, get your boy happy, man, ten. Since you poor, never won. I the drum for the team And I GPI and not cause we the scheme When I'm a drink, say cool ball off, who no get dreams How you they feel when you see me on your screens How they feel so redeemed if you ask me And I'm for four kind of question, me, they don't gas me When I'm small, I'll cut you off, yeah, that's how I'll be Me them say, be them to share ways, then free attack me But they no go get, pay be before fro But throw all my respects, what they mean if you give up Die for brothers, smoke on my for Toto Play my cards right, smooth, yeah, they say so so If I watch the legs, you step on They put me up, we assume, yeah, yeah, Jim Sam Tala, I'm with their weapons Yeah, be my boy, you be some, give me them 